Okay, so we're almost done. The only thing left to do right now is, instead of solving problems the way we solved the previous problem, where we simply reasoned out how to cut things in half until we eventually figured out the number of half-lives, and then I multiplied the period of time that one half-life corresponds to with the number of half-lives that passed, and I get the time that passed between the two measurements of the 120 and the 15. Alternatively, what I might do is to use graphs. And the way that the graphs work is like this. So we're going to draw two different graphs. So make sure to leave enough room on your paper. So we're going to count this in half-lives. One, two, three, four, six. And let's start up here at 100%. And we'll find the halfway point. This is about 50. Find the halfway point again. That's 75. We'll find the halfway point again. Here's 25. So this is half-lives. And over here is So we're actually going to measure two different atoms on here. So I'm not going to say that it's the radioactive atoms, it's not the parent or the daughter, it's both. So what I would find is that time equals zero, I have zero of the daughter, and I have 100% of the parent. Now what I know is that the, at the end of one half-life, I'll have 50%. So that means I can plot a point right about here. At the end of two half-lives, I'll only have half of that amount, so I'll be down to 25%. I'm essentially using the numbers from our table, these numbers from our table, to figure out where I need to plot at each of these possible, these potential points. So at the third half life, I'll have half of the 25, or approximately 12.5. Fourth life, I'll have half of that amount. The fifth half life, I'll have half of that amount. At the sixth half life, I'll have half of that amount. So I end up with a curve that looks something like this. Okay, and this is an exponential curve. All right, the difference between an exponential curve and an inverse is that an inverse will go up and never quite meet the axis. So the inverse would go up like this, whereas this one actually, the exponential curve, actually does run into the y-axis. It starts at a definitive point. Now obviously, this is the parent. This is the parent nuclei. Then the daughter has sort of the inverse curve. So I start with zero. At the end of one half-life, half of the daughter has been turned into, half of the parent has been turned into the daughter. And then at each point, I find that I'm getting half that remaining amount back. So I find that at, at 75%, then I was at half. So I'm trying to reach up here to the point where I have 100%. So now I'm here. I find that I'm here, here, and here, and so the curve looks exactly the opposite. The curves are very much inverses of each other. At any point, I can add the total number of particles, and they have to add up to the original amount of particles that I had in the beginning, or the total number of nuclei. Now remember, there's different ways to measure the half-life, though. So let's take another look at this graph at what could you plot on the left axis that's going to follow this half-life rule. It turns out the number of atoms, or the percent of atoms, that's not the only way to do it. So let's move the vertical axis over a little bit. And this time on the axis, let's go ahead and pick units of time. We're going to talk, we're going to use, uh, this time we're going to use hours. So we'll do time and hours. Now, 
what are the possible ways that we could measure this half-life rule, this curved path that it's going to follow? Well, we could look at the activity. And the activity, of course, would be in Becquerel's. I could look at the number of atoms. I could look at the number, sorry, the number of moles of the substance. That's another way of counting atoms is in terms of the number of moles that you have of them. I might look at the mass. How much of the mass of the original sample is still as the parent and how much of the mass, and this would either be in grams or in kilograms. So I could look at the number of atoms, number of molecules, like, or number of moles. I could look at the mass of the sample. I could look at the activity of the sample. Any one of these would follow that same path. And so let's say, for example, that we have, let's put 100 at the top up here. This could be 100 becquerels. It could be 100 atoms. It could be 100 moles. It could be 100 grams. It could be 100 kilograms. It could be any one of these. I'm not specifying which one it is. So we'll say 75 and 25. And let's say, for example, that this guy follows a curve that looks something like this. Now your curve will be a little bit different than my curve. So we may get different answers to the question that I'm just about to ask you, and that is, what is the half-life of this? So what I could do is I could pick any point that I want to. So I might pick the point, let's say I go to 60, and I go across, and I drop down, and I find that's approximately... 1.1 1 .1 hours. Now, to find the half-life, I need to go down to where there are only 30. 30 might be a position like this. And I would draw this guy across. And I'll find that that occurred at, let's say, 2.3 hours. So that means that the half-life this distance across here would represent the half life and so I would find that I have a half life of 1.2 hours now I could pick any point I could have started at 100 and gone to 50 and come down and I would find that I would be at 1.2 hours I could have started down here at 20 and gone across, dropped down, gone down to 10, gone across, dropped down, and I would have gotten the same answer. Now typically you're probably going to want to stay in the early part of the graph. You'll find it's easier to read because of course as we draw the lines further and further across it's going to be a little more difficult for us to read the value of the, the time. But in this case I chose the number 60, I could have picked 80, I could have picked 90, and then I go to a, po a position on the vertical axis that's exactly half of that, and I draw vert horizontal lines across to figure out at what time did these occur, and then I simply subtract one from the other, and that gives me the value of the half-life. So this is a very easy way for you to figure out the half-life, and you might see any one of these four possibilities, the number of atoms, the number of moles, the activity, or the... Uh, mass of the material. And that's it. That's basically radioactivity in a nutshell. And so at this point now, there's really nothing left to do but to try some practice problems. And uh, we'll take a look at some of the um, example problems from the textbook.